I'm just telling us at this point in time, because it's, it's things that they don't want us to know. They didn't want us to know. And now that they're finally coming forward and saying, well, there's these UAPs, UFOs. Now it's time for us to, to go ahead and go forward. And we can't move into the next generation of major technologies until these people actually get up off of the fact that they've known about all of this stuff for the longest time. So with that, uh, running that down to you, hopefully James is back from uh, yeah, wedding I, his whistle. I mean, okay. Yeah, I, I'm back. I don't know about my voice, but uh, mm. it gets this way in the evening anyway. And if people knew me from 40 years ago, they said, well, your voice is totally different than it was way back when. I had uh, I had a breathing tube down my throat going through brain surgery for 11 hours here. Uh, the day challenger blew up, and my voice has been a little bit gravelly ever since. But I'm alive, so I'm I'm happy with that part. But but we're going back to uh, uh, talking about John Lear and some of the crazy stuff that's going on in the desert, and just to sort of uh, uh, give you an idea of. of where I'm coming from in today's world is I'm a published author, among other things. I'm working on my tw uh, my 29th book is at the printer. My 28th book is still being worked on, and I have to. I'm just waiting for the Navy. But I have, uh, because of my friendship with John Lear and the people that were introduced to me by John Lear, I have uh, I've had a, a I, I, the time of my life. One, you know, one of the the uh, people that I met, not maybe directly because of John, but uh, but part and parcel because of John Lear, is I became friends with uh, Mr. Ben Rich. Ben Rich replaced Kelly Johnson as the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, the most advanced aeronautical design group on the planet. And we spoke, uh, we spoke pretty consistently once a quarter for about 25 years. If I didn't call him, he called me. If I called him and he was in a meeting, June would still put him through. That was the secretary. He would always answer my calls. He'd put me on speakerphone and we'd sit there and talk about things that go bump in the night or half hour, 45 minutes, sometimes even uh, approaching an hour. This is the president of the Lockheed Skunk Works, a real important guy, and he took time out of his day to talk to me. I'm, I'm not anybody special. I, I happen to love what this comes out of the Skunk Works. And you know, because of that, I have, it opened a door that I never thought would open. I didn't even know the door was there to be opened. But one of the things that, because of John Lear, and because of my friendship with, with the people in his circle, Ben called me in August of 89, and he said, Jim said, the Blackbirds, and those, those I hope everybody knows what an SR-71 Blackbird is. It's the world's only operational 2100 mile an hour spy plane. It's now, it's been retired for 30 years, which I find amazing. Uh, John, and, uh, James? Yes. Uh, uh, let me direct people to the, uh, the show page and your items. If you go to the other side of midnight.com and you click on tonight's banner and you go and you get to the show page, then you can go down a little bit to the fast links and click on James and it will take you to James items. And then you'll get to see what a blackbird looks like. Uh, Keith. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's also, it's the plane that the X-Files, or X-Files, the X-Men fly X. for comic book and movie fans. Yeah. Okay. At least that's, you know, supposedly what it is. So that's where, if somebody can't get to the webpage, that's, you've seen it in, in the X-Men movies. It's slightly modified. Or a representation. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, there's the Shiara technology that gives it the ability to go into space, but that's not relevant here. Yeah, no, that's all. <laughs> yeah. So, uh. So Ben, you know, Ben calls me and, he's, and he said, Jim says, I have it from the horse's mouth. 
I don't know if that was Tip O'Neill or who it was back at the, you know, back in uh, 89. I think he was gone by then, but it's not, that's not important. He said, if anybody I know can scrounge a blackbird, it'd be you. So I said, okay, I'm gonna start working on it. And the first thing I did the next day is I, was, I went over to the guard base and I uh, got on there. Your military, this is before cell phones, and you didn't want to pay for a long distance call. You'd go on Autobahn or DSN, as they called it. And I called the Adjutant General for the State of New York National Guard, they, both the Air and the Army Guard. And uh, called the secretary, answered the phone, and said, General Weaver's uh, office. I said, This is Sergeant Goodall with the 133rd. Is General Weaver available? Just a second, Sarge, I'll put you through. Now, you can do this in the Air Guard. You, do, you don't do it in the regular you know, regular military. You know, you're violating the chain of command. But the Air Guard, you don't have one. So General Weaver gets on and said, Sarge, how can I help you? And I said, sir, I got a proposition for you. He said, well, what's that? He said, how would the New York Air Guard like to move the world's fastest airplane in a couple of your C-5s? You know, he was dead quiet for a few seconds. He said, do you mean the Blackbird? I said, yes, sir. He said, when you're ready, you call Will Hall. So fast forward a little bit, Arnie Gunderson, who was Mr. J-58, that was, the, that was the engine used in the Blackbird. They were trying to get a Blackbird for West Palm Beach. And he'd inquired into the Air Force what it would cost to lease a, a C-5. And they said that 960, Seven thousand dollars a day plus gas, and I scrounged two, you know, two C5s for eight days each. So uh, Sergeant Bilko doesn't have anything on me. But so you know, this this went forward. I went to my boss, you know, General Broman, General Schwab. He was a two-star. So I want to get a Blackbird for our museum. And they both laughed at me. I said, Generals, rather than you know, rather than laugh at me, why don't you give me the opportunity to fail? I said, right, Smarty, how are you going to get it here? I said, I got that covered. And that's what I told them about uh, the New York Air Guard. And they just scratched their heads. And they just, good, good all. I don't, I don't, I don't know, want to know how you did it, but uh, we'll, we'll help push the paperwork through. So I got the, uh, the authorization from the Air Force Museum in September of, uh, actually August of, uh, 90 that they were turning over the eighth production cia version of the blackbird the uh and, and the designation is a like an article 12. so i had i got the eighth production a12 was assigned to us so we went to palmdale on the uh, 10th of october of 91 a question of 90 and this was uh we took the airplane apart in, in two and a half days. I had three E-9 chief master sergeants, three E-8 senior master sergeants, a gaggle of master sergeant E-7s, and a couple of us tech sergeants. We took that airplane apart in two and a half days. We had to leave, came back uh, two weeks later, and we had to arrange for the C-5s. And we loaded the C-5 up, flew from Palmdale to Travis for gas, spent the night there. And we only had about an inch and a half of clearance when we rolled this, the Blackbird into the, into the C-5. So the, on the 27th of October, we're heading back to uh, Minneapolis. We, we leave Travis, we're out about you know, 45 minutes and the, uh, the chief is going down to check the load. And I asked if I can go with him and he said, sure, come on down. So I went down and I decided I was gonna do something no one else has done. I climbed up on the landing gear. We had the wings cut off, but it was on its gear. I walked along the chines. I had the canopy blocked open with wheel chalk. I had a five gallon bucket in on the ejection seat with a cushion on top. And it was all, you know, the seat was all the way down. I get in the cockpit, I close the canopy and I'm in there for about 45 minutes. And I'm just going zoom, zoom, just, you know, I mean, I'm a kid, I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years old. Instead of being locked in the cockpit of the XF-104, I'm in the cockpit of the world's fastest operational spy plane, the Blackbird. 
And I got a rap on the bottom of the fuselage that, hey, we got to go back up. So we head back upstairs in the C5. And now we're coming in our final. We're about 35, 40 minutes out of Minneapolis. And the chief comes back to me and he said, the boss said, you can be in the cockpit when we land. Well, I'm already the forward of the wing box, so I'm in the cockpit area. And he said, no, no, downstairs. So I went back downstairs, got into the cockpit, and uh, the airplane landed, and we unloaded. And I called Ben the next day, and I said, Ben, I think I have a, a Blackbird record that no one on the planet could can achieve. Not now, not later, not ever. I'm the only one. He said, what's that? He said, I'm the only person in the world to have been in the cockpit of a Blackbird at 33,000 feet at Mach 0.72 inside another airplane and i landed that same airplane inside another airplane and ben just started laughing he said i'm almost tempted to issue a mach 3 card actually mach 3 minus card for you because no one will be able to top that so it's, that's my that's my primary claim to fame when it comes to airplanes i'm not a pilot uh but i have been in the cockpit of some of the most incredible airplanes in the world the blackbird being one of them including the B-2 and the F-117 and uh, MiG-29C, uh, which is the nuclear-capable uh, uh, MiG-29. And it's just been... Uh, it's just been a kick. But one of the things that, like I said, I, I talked to Ben about once a quarter for 25 years, and it's now... It's, uh, it's, it's the late 90s, or mid, mid to late 90s. Ben Rich is in the hospital. He's suffer, he's uh, dying of esophageal cancer. He was uh, around all the nasty chemicals used with making uh, low observable airplanes. And we were you know we were talking and uh, we're talking about our friend John Lear and uh, my you know, our mutual friend the late John Andrews. And we when we talked started talking about a bunch of stuff and he's and then Ben says Jim. We have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. Not what you think in building 50 years, but what you can comprehend. And I can comprehend a heck of a lot. And if you've seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. And prior to that, in 1993 at, at UCLA, it was a graduate, aeronautical graduate student, and Ben was the keynote speaker. He said basically the same thing. He said, we have the ability to take E.T. home. Now, think about that for a second. This is the mid-90s. If anybody in the world knows what's happening in the, in the spooky world, in the black, black world of, of secret programs, it would have been Ben Rich. And Ben says... We have the ability to take ET home, but our government will not allow us to release that information. And it's just one of the most frustrating things in the world. I mean, we have that technology. And to sort of support uh, UF, other Kit Peak National Observatory side of years and telescopes in the world is at Kitt Peak. They have 22 optical telescopes every uh, running from a 12 inch primary mirror to a 13 foot primary mirror on the Mayall uh, four meter telescope and they have two uh, radio telescopes a 12 meter and a 25 meter. One of the one of the other uh, telescopes on the on the mountain was the 2.1 meter, which is about an eight foot uh, primary mirror, and it was run and controlled by Caltech for five years. And over their five over this period of five years, their job was to look at a very small postage stamp size part of our Milky Way, not the universe, but just our Milky Way looking for exoplanets. And over the course of the, the five years, using adaptive optics and remote, remote operation, they were able to catalog and name and identify 
eight thousand exoplanets. And just think about that. I mean, that's a there's a lot there's a, for for a world that didn't think that we were the that that thought we were the only ones. It turns out we're not. So just before I I left being a volunteer, we had a gathering of all of the astronomers, all of the technicians, and all of the docents. Uh, uh, down at the uh, University of Arizona, their main campus, which is also the headquarters for the National Optical Ast Astronomy Observatories, NOAOA. And we had one of the top uh, astronomers from the National Science Foundation was, our, was the speaker. It was beer and pizza and an information type of uh, gathering. And he, after he went through some of the other stuff that were, you know, we had been talking about, he got to the part that was interesting. He said, he had just returned from a worldwide gathering of everyone that's that's searching for exoplanets. All the astronomers, all the uh, telescopes that are out there, use, you know, being used to look for exoplanets. And said, based on the proven mathematical formulas that have, you know, that have uh, proven to be correct over you know over the years, he said we calculate for every star in the universe. And that's an incredible number. You can't even put the decibel points, you know, in your head. There's just too many of them, not counting the numbers. But for every star in the universe, there's one and a half planets. And for every, out of that incredible number of planets, they figure that there are in the neighborhood of two billion, that's with a B, two billion Earth-like planets orbiting a similar sized brown dwarf star as our sun in the inhabitable zone with liquid water. And to quote Jodie Foster's character in Carl Sagan's movie, Contact, if we're the only ones, what a waste of space. So you couple, couple that with the fact that uh, Bob Lazar's, you know, said he was working on revo reverse engineering of a, a, a propulsion system for alien spacecraft. You take the, you know, the conversation I had with Ben Rich just before he died. You take the, uh, the piece that, uh, you know, he spoke about at uh, UCLA in 90, I think it was 93. It was shortly after he retired from the Skunk Works. That leads me to believe that we're not alone. And there's a lot of stuff out there that 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 can't be explained. And it's just, I mean, that's why when I go outside, I look I look up at the sky all the time, and I I have never I have never felt that we we're alone. And James, <laughs> yes, uh, I I had encounters of the third kind, and I know we're not alone. Uh, when I first had my first encounter, I just thought it was a dream. And then when I had the second one, nope, they left evidence on me that proved that, hey, they were there. And I knew something was going on. Um, my first sighting of a craft making a 90 degree turn at full speed and then cutting back at a 45 degree angle and then back at another 45 and still climbing. I, I knew that nothing could make a turn like that at full speed and the retention of vision showed the angles that it was making while I'm looking at it. And that's what caught my eye. That kind of technology does exist. We just aren't privy to it. There's two. Correct, correct. There's two I mean, civilizations. There's the one where we're flying into space on a flame and there's the other one that's using the electromagnetic spectrum of the universe to get from point A to point B. No flame. Well, I mean, to add a little bit to that, I have a, he passed away here last year or year before last due to COVID. He was a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. He flew SR-71s and his name was Dave Fruhoff. And he was a friend of mine. He, you know, he called uh, Lynchburg, Tennessee, the home of Jack Daniels, as his home. And my dad lived in Tullahoma. So every time I visit my dad, I go visit Dave. But I was interviewing him because uh, he, he was a student pilot when he, 
actually had a bailout of a Blackbird. You know, they had a total electrical failure. So we, 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 I went there to talk about that, and I asked him, I said, hey, Dave, he said, do you believe in UFOs? And he said, his eyes got really big, he said, absolutely, positively, they do exist. I said, I figured he would just poo-poo me away, and when I asked him, you want to expand upon that? And he said, sure. And I just, yeah, I was, I was really taken back. And he said, he was flying a night training mission out of Kadena, Okinawa, in uh, late 72, early 73. It's still, the Vietnam War is still hot and heavy. He's flying a night training mission. He's at 78,000 feet in altitude. He's doing Mach 2.7, which is about 1,800 miles an hour, 1,700 miles an hour. He's going straight and level. There's a three-quarter moon off to his left, and he gets a glint off of something reflective five or six miles off to his right and five or 6,000 feet above him. So he contacts Kadena on Secure Voice to see if another SR-71 is up there. And he said, no, you're up there by yourself. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm going to take a look. So he pushes the throttle forward, never takes his eyes off the object. And there's about a 10 degree bank. And he starts climbing and started, getting, and started heading towards this object. When he was still a couple thousand feet below it, and still about a mile or so away, he's, he can't get the shape because there's too much reflection inside the cockpit, and he didn't want to open his visor. This thing took off at about a 30-degree angle of attack and left him in the dust. He said he lost sight of it going, going through between 180 and 200,000 feet, and it left him in, going at least Mach 12. So fast forward to 1979, 1980, he retires from the Air Force. He has a real high clearance. He applies for and gets a job as facility manager at Area 51. So he got there. He knew you don't go asking questions if you're the newbie. You don't ask questions anyway, but you don't ask questions in a, cl in a classified work environment. So he was, there about, he was there about a year before he actually got enough courage to ask some of the guys at the club, said, hey, did we ever flight test something here that can outrun a Blackbird? And everybody said, not here. Doesn't mean it wasn't done somewhere else, but it wasn't flown out of here. So what did, it, what did Dave Fruhoff chase if it, wasn't, if it wasn't developed by Lockheed, if it wasn't built at the Skunk Works or the, the Phantom Works for McDonnell Douglas and Boeing or the uh, Black Widow home there at, uh, at Northrop, Northrop Grumman. The stuff is out there. It's just that the fact that us peons don't have the clearance, don't have the wherewithal to know, you know, to know where our tax money is being spent. And that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a pain in the butt to the military I've had uh, was that little red dots on my chest, <laughs> and I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of them. And did, I, I'm did Binrich ever say uh, something about there was a flaw in the math and they figured it out? And no, no, because because uh, when I asked him to expand upon what he would, what he had just told me, he said, very typical Ben Rich. No, I can't help you with that. And, uh, and they, he had the nerve to die on me about 10 days later, and that really broke my heart because he had agreed to give me a no-holds-barred interview taped with a, with a, a analog clock behind him with the sweep second hand so he can know if it was uh, edited or not. And he said, I had to get this book done with Leo Janos first. That's... Uh, his book on the on the skunk works so i never did have a chance to to do a one-on-one -on -one, ask him any question that he would answer interview so yeah well we're coming up on a break um we're about a minute out uh because yeah, i i heard the story about the you know, ben rich saying something about that there was a flaw in the math but they figured it out and i met this russian guy on a plane uh, to fly to Dallas. Uh, actually, it was a connecting flight. We had to stop at uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And he he recognized the Morgan curve on my shirt, but he didn't see the picture on the back. And he says, oh, the Morgan curve. And I said, this old guy's got pretty good eyesight. He said, 
And then he says, yeah, that's on Mars in the Sidonia region. And I said, excuse me, I want to sit next to him. <laughs> and he was Russian, he, but he didn't have a Russian accent. He said, yeah, you probably wonder why uh, I'm talking with a Southern drawl. He said, yeah, I picked that up from the rednecks I was working with out there at Papoose <laughs> And he's telling me about how they grew a ceramic lens for the, the uh, surveillance camera on SR-71. And I'm going grow a ceramic lens. He said that was the easy part. Getting it to stop from growing was the hard part. Okay, James, I'm going to be back. We're going to be back in a minute. We're going into break time. And uh, I would, uh, if anybody's got any uh, ideas of, uh, uh, or any questions, I think I'm going to have You've open lines me. in the last hour. All right, we'll be back in a minute. Midnight.com. Join Richard C. Hoagland and an array of fascinating guests as we explore real world topics and events through the lens of hyperdimensional physics. Join Club 19.5 to gain access to hundreds of archived shows. Only $9.95 per month. Listen in each Saturday and Sunday to the most compelling and thoughtful broadcast heard in over 160 countries around the world. Real research. Real data. Real science. The other side of midnight.com. The other side of midnight.com. Talk radio, with pictures on demand. Liberate your hyperdimensional time scale, and non-linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio, with pictures on demand. The other side of midnight.com. James has been giving us some really good information. We're talking a living history here. And I, would, before we went to break, I would brought up uh, the Russian guy, Adipol, who worked uh, at Papoose Lake. Uh, he didn't tell me he worked at Papoose Lake. He said he worked at one of the lakes out in Nevada. And I said, you worked at Area 51? And he said, no, uh, there's other lakes out there. And I said, Papoose Lake? And he said, oh, oh you didn't hear that from me. So. He's telling me about uh, the kind of stuff that he was doing because he worked on the fuel for the SR-71 Blackbird. But then uh, he said he was a theoretical physicist, uh, but he never got his degree because Groman came along and hired him up immediately. And uh, But he said he had a... He, he had a, a good background in all of the stuff that was going on and um, they let him go 
And about that time is the time that Bob Lazar said that um, they had let all the Russians go because they had figured something out and they didn't want the Russians around to kind of, I guess, do what uh, the Rosenbergs did uh, and hand that information over to the Russians. So the technology is there. We've had it for the longest time. And the guys like Adipole and guys like James Goodall, they don't really get their props. They won't get their props until this stuff is finally released. <laughs> and after it is released, they, they still may not get their props because these guys are going to act like we didn't know. But you've got living history here with James Adipole, guys that have been doing this stuff behind the scenes for the longest time, and nobody knows they are there. That's why we're interviewing James, uh, but we're, we're talking about John Lear as well, because John Lear was a, a UFO investigator, and um, he had experiences. And <clears throat> Richard Hoagland, he used to not want to deal with UFOs. Well, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't know. I'm not going there. There's, there's no solid evidence. Well, his tune has changed too. Just like the media, when people would do a news report on UFOs and they'd be snickering and laughing. They don't laugh anymore. Okay? Because when the Navy came out and said, hey, look at these videos, these things are real. They shut up and started to listen. Where they go from here? Well, oh, oh, would you want to say, Jim? I know I do. I didn't say anything. Oh, oh, was, oh, that was me, Claire. That was me, Claire, in my throat. Sorry. Oh. Uh, so. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Keith. I have a, I have a question. Okay. Well, we're, we're in a transition, and we're growing up. The question is, are we ready? To grow up and find out that hey we are not the only kids in the neighborhood so what's your question ron hey uh well for james james uh since we're as keith pointed out uh we were we put john lear on the header there i just wondered in your opinion since you knew him for so long was uh was he was he a digger or was he just collecting information that he bumped into because of his incredible uh, aviation career. Oh, no, he, uh, he tracked people down. And both, yeah, both John and I did this long before there was an internet. So if you were going to talk to somebody, you had to fly to the destination that person called home or where, he, where they worked. You had to get him on the phone or write him a letter. Hopefully they would respond. And then you could sit down and talk with them. So there was, there was no thing of, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna Google this. Well, Google wasn't invented yet. You know, either was the internet when I started. I've been doing this for 50 years. I did it, started doing it when, when I was, it did, never affected my security clearance directly, but it, it, I got a lot of static be, by what I did. And uh, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm a truth seeker. I'm a, I'm a historian. That's all my books are. I write historical monographs on military aircraft, naval ships, and submarines. And my, you know, my area of expertise is the Blackbird, the F-117, the B-2, Have Blue, stealth in general, and uh, things that go bump in the night. Yeah, oh, well, you're a perfect candidate then. Yeah, the, yeah something I say, I say a lot is that uh, the, there are people walking around with degrees tacked on to degrees and um, ego tacked on to ego that uh, <laughs> they are no match for most writers because writers of historical works or even science fiction, they do so much research. They get their teeth so far into the subject matter so that they understand it to give a you know a background to their whatever their narrative and their stories are, that it's you can't the academics can't match it. 
because they start with a predetermined goal and try to get there. You know, it's different. The writers are absorbing the raw context information. So that's why I asked you. I just wondered if uh, Bob Lear had any had developed. Why is somebody else here? You know, of course there's others out there. And a lot of them, probably most of them look like us. But, you know, why are they here in the first place? Anyway, that's that's where I was going with it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah like I said, I started doing this long before there was, the Internet was developed and long before it became popular. But I can remember in the uh, mid-'80s, I, worked, I, I reported to Major General Wayne Gatlin, and he was my boss. He was, he was chief of staff for AIR. And there was some stuff on the UFO. I was enlisted. I said, just, I'm flying an F-4 or an F-16, and I encounter an unknown. What? He said, well, it's over for your post-flight debrief. That, take a shower, get cleaned up, go, go to the club, Get a couple, two or three really, really stiff drinks, down them, go back to your billet, and forget everything you saw that day. I said, why is that? He said, well, if you want to destroy your career, that's what you do. You go up, you go tell the brass, hey, I chased a UFO. And the next thing you know, oh, gee, for some reason, you, you don't have any flying slots available for you anymore. And, oh, your promotion has been, de- you know, been declined. Oh, you and you didn't get promoted, you know, at this particular point. So you're either being rifted or you're being released from the military. So you you did you're emptying wastebaskets in in Anchorage or something. Yeah, I mean it's just it's yeah. You're you're playing you're playing you're playing a game that you have you do have no idea what the rules are, and none of them are in your favor. So just shut up. Forget about it. Pretend like it never happened. I, I was flying to Manchester for an ABC remote, and my plane was at 30,000 feet. Clouds were at 20,000 feet, all the way to the horizon, thick clouds. And I'm just looking out the window, you know, just gawking at the clouds. And then this disc comes out from underneath over the plane. It wasn't moving. It was us flying over top of it, and it's just hovering just just above the clouds at 20,000 feet. This thing was so huge, I think we could have gone down to, to the 20,000 foot uh, range and landed on that sucker. And I'm looking at this, the pilot had to see this. I, I was like amazed that nobody said anything, nobody. Did. But this was shortly after 9-11 and I didn't want to make a ruckus and say, hey, UFO out the right side of the plane. You know, yeah. I just looked at it, watched it go under the wing because we were flying over it. It wasn't moving. And when I got off the plane, I just kind of looked at the, the, the captain and just gave him this weird look with a little shake, nodded a shake of the head like, okay, I know you're not going to talk about that because... They don't talk about it. They, they, they weren't going to talk about it because they didn't want to lose their jobs. But I'm, I'm wondering how they're handling this now, how all of the major carriers are handling reports of things like this. Now that the Navy says, hey, these things are out there. They're in front of your planes. You, you can see them. Uh, how do you avoid them? You can't. They have to avoid well, us. They've got that technology to do it. Well, thing, things have changed so dramatically in the last probably six or seven years. Is things have started to loosen up, where it's no longer a taboo to report an unknown. But there was a American Airlines flight. Uh, it, they were being controlled out of the uh, Albuquerque Center, and it, they on the air they broadcasted, and it was recorded by by a friend of mine, who was a electronic interceptor. He has a a noise-activated recorder. Anybody transmits on these certain frequencies, he records all of it. And this American airline pilot says, my God, it's a tower. said, did you see that? Something, 
a, a tube just went flying directly across in front of us, going thousands of miles an hour. Do you have it on radar? Or something along those lines. And th th that was broadcast all over the planet. Oh. So it's, it's, no, it's no longer a taboo to talk about UFOs. I know when, when Tucker Carlson came out, along with the, uh, someone from the federal government said there, there are craft uh, flying in our, over our military installations and in our airspace that were, are not from, from here, not from Earth. So I was talking, I was, I, was, I was up in Sholo, Arizona, a buddy of mine, and we were talking to a couple guys out of, the Cousin Brothers out of uh, Hawaii, and they had called Doc, and they were talking to him, and said, they were looking for some guy who lives in Arizona named Jim Goodall, and Doc starts laughing. He said, well, he's about three feet from me. He said, does he, does he know how to get hold of Lazar? And I, and I piped up and said, yeah, why? So would you call him and ask him what he thought of, of Tucker Carlson's re, uh, report? So I got on the I got on the phone, called him up, called his wife, and uh, she said, "Well, you gonna come in and give us a visit?" And I said, "Well, soon, hopefully." And Bob got on the phone, and he has a very distinctive voice, and he said, "You know, when it when it first first reported, I got really excited, but then I said, now wait a second, there's one one guy from the government." One guy uh, named T T T Tucker Carlson talking about it. I got to wait for the other shoe to drop, and then I'll get excited. And it never, it never did drop. And if it wasn't for the fact that it was, it uh, there was a chance of snow in his neighborhood, I was supposed to be with Bob Lazar th this last weekend, and uh, and my car, my car cannot drive on snow at all or ice. I have a. 435 horsepower Corvette with big tires, and it's a death trap on damp or frozen pavement. So I had to, I had to cancel my visit to visit Bob Lazar. I was going there up after John Lear's memorial service, but that fell apart. But the stuff, stuff is out there, and it's just fortunate. Fortunately, uh, more and more people are getting better uh, smartphones. I would love to see someone with a with a good Nikon or Canon, with a you know with a 200 or 400 millimeter, their top of the line lens, or even a 600 millimeter, let's get some detail on some of these objects that are out there. The 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 tri the, the triangles that are being pop are popping up everywhere, all over the planet. And and the what one do you know the, about the triangles? Well, if they if they have a red or green light on 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 the wingtips, they're we made them, right? Uh, if they if they don't and are sort of you know, translucent at times, maybe they're not from here. I but saw even I saw a triangle uh, out here at Crofton, Maryland, um, and it was flying at treetop level. And it was it wasn't flying; it was floating. I mean, it was going slow as molasses. And at first, light came out from over the trees. It was huge, and something gave me the willies and i didn't know what it was at the time and then as that light came further out then there was this red light that came out from behind that and then these two lights in the corners of this triangle shape come out and i now know what scared the hell out of me even though those lights were as bright as they were they weren't lighting up the treetop level they weren't lighting up the street but they were bright as all get out of heck. And I'm going, how come the light isn't reaching the ground? What the heck Ooh. could do that? Okay. Cause I, I have a, I have a, okay. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, that's, I got a triangle report that I was, well, I, I was leaving the anecdotes out, but this was back uh, during the first Gulf War. Sorry, I didn't have the actual date, but I did not having a Nikon. I'm a Nikon fan myself. Uh, currently, I um, did a uh, I did a quick a color sketch after I went inside. Uh, it was overcast, but there was a full moon. Okay, and for something made me go outside. It sounded like thunder, and so I walked out and I walked up on a hill to uh, get a better look at the sky. And there were big gaps in the clouds, and it, all of a sudden, this 
huge triangle. And these are low clouds. That, uh, you know, so I don't know, what, 2,000 feet maybe? You know, uh, the, uh, not much more. There are hills behind them, and they weren't hitting those. Uh, they, uh, through this gap comes this gigantic triangle, and it was kind of a gray color. And it had five really large rectangular plates or windows on the bottom, and they were all different colors. And I was absolutely mesmerized by the fact that the colors, which were, and they were weird pastel colors, still bright though. It was like a turquoise and a yellow and a green one, kind of a grassy green, and a, a pink one. And they were, uh, the, the color was brightest right down the long center line of those panels. And it got, it kind of faded out toward the edges. It was kind of the opposite of what you might, might it's hard to describe because it didn't look like it was behaving properly. But on the rest of the surface, there were what looked like nozzles. That's how close and clear this thing was. They were they looked like the if you knock the head off of a shower fitting, you know, the nozzle the nozzle part that's left with a little pivot. They looked like that or something that should be on somebody's lawn. And they were evenly spaced all over the bottom of this thing. And it wasn't uh, emitting anything. Uh, and it was going fairly slowly, so I got a good I got a good scan look at it, and it was. Uh, but the noise that had drawn me outside seemed to be connected to it, but it wasn't coming from it. It was like distant thunder, but the, it was like a roll that followed along with it as it moved. So I'm saying, okay, this all has to mean something, but I don't think that was one of ours because it didn't have any tip lights on that either. Things. It was like an isosceles triangle. It wasn't even, but uh, and it seemed to have a bulge on the top. When it finally, when it passed fully over, the glimpse I got of the back, it looked like there was something going on at the back. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just I don't know what that was. But it was it it sounded almost a lot of them, and I just happened to see one of them that went over the gap in the clouds. So I that's that was the triangle sighting that I had. Well, and the and the triangles are being seen everywhere. I mean, we're talking about Africa. I think there's been reports in in, in Antarctica, uh, all over. You know, there was a Belgian and it, and flap. That's when when I saw my triangle. Uh, uh -huh. There was the Belgian flap where the police officers and so forth were reporting these triangular craft with the three lights on the corners and, and the red light in the middle, and dead silent. And that's the way mine was. I was turning the radio down and rolling the window down, and my wife's. Something right, and I didn't realize what it was until. Do you have the round lights on? Like no, I yeah, these are perfect round. Yeah, and I that people have grabbed of those. I've never seen anybody catch a photograph of one of these, but I've seen other people describe them. Oh, one de one detail I left out. Sorry, the it was skimming the upper side of those clouds that it was passing over, so close that I could see the reflection of the colored light on the top of the clouds near the edge of the gaps. So it was literally skin, and if there were any other ones up there, they were all doing the same thing. It was like they were moving with, that's why they were relatively slow, they were moving with the cloud layer, like maybe they couldn't be detected on radar or something uh, if they were right next to the clouds. And all I could do was, you know, assemble details in my head. I don't know what was going on, but I'm, I don't think they were ours, but I don't know, and I don't know what those nozzles were. Did they have something to do with some sort of you know, stealth thing or camouflage that wasn't turned on? Was, was it, were they spraying pathogens to kill the population below? I have no idea. Uh, uh, James. Yeah, there's something going on. Okay. Yes. Ja James. Um, yes. You attended uh, John's uh, memorial. Yeah. And you said uh, it was unusual George Knapp didn't show up. I was I was really disappointed. First of all, I was, I was in Vegas for a 
gathering of uh, like-minded UFO nuts. I'm one of them. And we were at the Gold Nugget, and George was supposed to, you know, was going to be there on, on Saturday the, uh, the 23rd, uh, April 23rd. He didn't show. I figured he was tied up somewhere. But I said, thought for sure that on Sunday, he, w he wouldn't miss John Lear's memorial service, and he did. And I, and I'm sure he has. You know, I, I, I don't. I don't uh, control his time, uh, nor you know, am I in a position to criticize him because he has a he has a real job. I'm retired, so uh, he may have been called out somewhere. But I was. Uh, if 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 anybody should have been there, uh, George Knapp should have been one of them. And I was the other one. If, if someone was supposed to be there, it was going to be me. And I wouldn't have missed it for anything. And I saw John as early as uh, it was last November. And uh, he had they had sold the house, and he was uh, he was living by himself. His daughter Allie would, would come over every day, make sure that he uh, he had everything he needed and whatever. Uh, but John, I'm surprised John lasted as long as he did. When I saw him in 2015, I'd, I'd been at Nellis to do some shooting there at Red Flag, and I was supposed to give a presentation on the Blackbird, but uh, I was preempted because uh, a, wor a worldwide event happened, and uh, you know they, you know, you know, they didn't. You know, where I was supposed to speak wasn't available, but it's. Uh, what did John die of? It, well, he was uh, he was 79 and a half. He he died of burning the candle at both ends and in the middle, while he, you know while he was wearing a pair of gasoline shorts with a torch sticking out of his butt. I mean, he he was going Mach five or Mach ten, literally all the time. And he, I mean, that's that was his entire life. He had. He had a, he was a buccaneer. That's probably the best way to describe John Lear. He was a one-of-a-kind buccaneer. He did things that you would only you would only read about in a fiction model, in fiction, uh, not models, but you know, fiction-related books, and 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 whatever. I mean, there wasn't anything he couldn't he didn't do. I mean, and the fact the fact that he'd been in at least two plane crashes. One of them, uh, when he, I think he was still in, lived, going to school in Switzerland, he was doing some aerobatic uh, flying, and he was he, he did a loop, miscalculated his altitude, and literally slammed into the ground. And if you can picture the rattle pe pedals being a bar, mm -hmm. and you take your hand and say put the bar right in the middle of your palm, of your yeah, middle of your your hand. And now bend your fingers down so they touch your the the heel. I mean the uh, the the bottom of your hand. That's what happened to his feet. He literally wrapped his feet around the rudder pedals where his toes touched his heel, yeah. and he shattered most of the bones in his feet. And that that uh, he suffered from that the rest of his life. I know back is you know even in the. Uh, 2010 time frame, 2008 time frame. He was he was seriously talking about having his his feet amputated just so he could you know, he could walk, and he wouldn't be confined to a scooter or a walker. And he was under constant pain. And fortunately, his daughter got him off of. Uh, all the opioids that the doctors were prescribing for him, and he'd sleep three, four days in a row. He'd be up for a couple hours and then go back to sleep. This went on for a couple years, and finally, Ali, you know, got some intervention in there, got some, you know, a lot of changes, and he literally got off of all the opioids and and such. But he still smoked those nasty, smelly cigars. <laughs> I always told him, he says, I walk in there, he'd smoke one of his cigars, cigars and I'd say, hey, Lear, is the uh, the local dump on fire? <laughs> what do you mean? I said, I, I'd swear that it smells like garbage burning. And he'd, look, and he'd look at his cigar and he said, it's my cigar and it's a good one. <laughs> oh, boy. He was a character. Sounds like Cohiba. Yeah. 
Yeah, he was a character. And there's and there's when it comes when it comes to aviation, when it comes to aeronautics, when it comes to things that go bump in the night, John used to spend his own time and his own money tracking down people that had claimed to be abducted. And when he found that person or persons, he would make arrangements in the uh, in the local area. He would he would uh, contact uh, whatever the the official uh, American His Hypnosis Society uh, group is, if there's such a thing. And he would get a board certified hypnotist and he'd pay, he would pay to have uh, the hypnotist meet him at, uh, or have the uh, abductee come to, come to the doctor's office and go under deep hypnosis. And he said he did that with 15 different people and said, out of the 15 different people, 13 of them, and he said, none of them had anything higher than uh, ambient temperature IQs. I mean, they weren't, none of them were very smart. None of them had any connection to each other. Hmm. And they were, and they were scattered all over, all over the U.S. But 13 of them had, under deep, deep hypnosis and regression, they had exactly the same experiences and saw the same things. Two of them, he said, you know, they, what they said was so outrageous, he knew, he knew that there was bull. Hey, James, and, James. Yes. I, sorry to interrupt you. I, I blew through the break um, where we're like a minute past where we should be doing the break. Okay. All so right. um, I, we'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, you're listening to the other side of midnight. We got a great thing going on with uh, uh, James Goodall, um, your host. And Ron Gerbron is here with us as well. So we'll be right back as soon as we uh, come back from this break. <laughs> 